We are going to finish our terms for 1D kinematics, so one-dimensional kinematics, just moving back and forth along a straight line. Today we're looking at acceleration. And then, once we've kind of defined acceleration, we'll look at special cases of acceleration where it's constant or close enough to constant that we can assume it's constant. Acceleration is a concept that gives students a little bit more trouble than some of the earlier ones, so you may have to kind of work through this lecture more than once. The last term we need in kinematics is acceleration. So acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with time. This is an idea that sometimes confuses students because we don't really talk about acceleration and deceleration in physics. Everything that is a rate of change in velocity is an acceleration, whether speeding up or slowing down. So yes, when you accelerate in your car, that's in physical terms an acceleration. But when you put the brakes on and slow down, in physics, that's also acceleration because in both of those cases, your velocity is changing. In a straight line, your velocity is changing because the magnitude of velocity is changing. If you turn, the direction changes, and that's also a change in velocity and is also an acceleration. So we can find average acceleration as the sort of final velocity minus the initial velocity divided by the change in time, so delta v over delta t. And just like we did with velocity, if we make acceleration as small as possible, sorry, if we make the change in time as small as possible, we can get instantaneous acceleration, which is the limit as our delta t approaches zero of the change in velocity over the change in time, or again, if you're calculus savvy, it's the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Now that we've learned all the terms, we're gonna go ahead and just review them and make sure they're set in our head. So first we had displacement, and displacement is just the change in position. So you've seen it as x2 minus x1, or x minus x sub zero. All they are is a change in position. It's important to remember that displacement can be positive or negative. It's also important to remember that displacement might be negative even when both positions are positive. So if I move from positive five meters to positive three meters, my second position, x2 is three meters, minus my first position, five meters, gives me negative two meters. So I have a negative displacement even though I'm in the sort of positive side of the axis. We next talked about, talked about average velocity. And with velocity, we're just thinking about displacement over time, or change in position over change in time. And that gives us the average velocity. Remember, it doesn't matter what happens between x2 and x1. If you run 70 miles, but start and end at the same place, the average velocity is zero. If you run 70 miles and start and end only one mile apart, the average velocity is one mile divided by however long it took you to run 70 miles. It only matters the final and the initial position, or all that matters are the final and the initial position. It doesn't matter what happens in between when we think about average velocity. With instantaneous velocity, we're taking that change in time to as small as is possible. So we're looking instantaneously in the smallest instance possible. What's the change in position over the change in time? And again, if you're calculus savvy, that's the derivative of with respect to position, the derivative of position with respect to time. If you're not, you can also remember that it is the slope of position versus time and it's the slope at any one point, so it's the tangent to that graph. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with time. So some later velocity minus some earlier velocity divided by the change in time. Again, average acceleration can be negative 
even when both of your velocities are positive. Same goes for average velocity. You can have a positive average velocity even if both your positions are negative. It just matters the difference between them. What matters is the rate of change. So we have average acceleration and then instantaneous acceleration as well. And with instantaneous acceleration, we're looking at the limit as we make our change in time as small as possible of the difference in velocity or delta V over delta T. So again, this would be the slope of the velocity versus time graph at any point in time. Now that we have that review kind of done, a couple questions just to make sure your brain is still clicking along with these 1D kinematics ideas. So a car leaves point X and travels by some route to point Y. We have no idea how they got there. They didn't pay any attention to Google Maps. Who knows? But they started at X, they ended at Y. What can we say about its displacement versus the distance traveled? For our next question, we want to figure out which of the following coordinate versus time graphs represents the motion of an object moving with a constant non-zero speed. So these graphs sometimes confuse students a little bit because we have x on the y-axis, but that's just position on the y-axis and time on the x-axis because time is actually the independent variable. So to answer this, you want to think about how speed relates to position. And how would you expect the position to change? What would you expect the graph of that position versus time to look like if the speed is constant and not zero? Great. So you've already worked through this, but just to make sure everybody understands the logic behind it, if it's moving at a non-zero speed, we know position has to be changing. So we can rule out option C. If the speed is constant, we said speed is kind of the magnitude of velocity, right? It's the sort of how fast. And if velocity is constant, velocity is the slope of position versus time. It's the change in position versus time. And so if that's constant, we're going to have a constant slope. So we can rule out A, D, and E because they have non-constant slopes. The slope is changing in all of those. If we look at B, we see that the position is decreasing. It's going from a positive position down to zero through time, but it's doing it with a constant slope. So in this case, we would have a constant negative velocity. So a car is moving to the east at 30 meters per second, which is relatively fast. That's on the order of 65 miles per hour. The driver slams on the brakes. What's the direction of the acceleration of the car and driver from the time the driver first applies the brakes to the time the car stops? So if the car was moving to the east but slowing down, the acceleration has to be to the west. If we let east be positive, and we say he starts off going 30 meters per second positive, so positive 30 meters per second, and ends going 0 meters per second, 0 meters per second minus that positive 30 meters per second will give us a negative value for our acceleration. If east was positive, then west would be negative. So we know it's to the west. In general, pretty much always, if an object is traveling in one direction, in the positive direction and slowing down, the acceleration is negative. If it's traveling in the negative direction and slowing down, the acceleration is positive. When acceleration and velocity have the same sign, the object is speeding up. When acceleration and velocity have opposite signs, the object is slowing down.
now that we have that out of the way, we're going to talk a little bit about constant acceleration. So, as I said in the beginning, if acceleration is constant, or at least close enough to constant that we can assume it is, for a lot of things that we're going to work at, it might not be perfectly constant, but we can make that assumption. So when this is the case, we can actually use special equations of motion. Before we get into that, we want to think about how the graphs of acceleration, velocity, and position versus time would look with constant acceleration. Conveniently, we have a little video we're going to watch of constant acceleration so that we can see what that might look like. Okay, so now we've taken the video and broken it down to look at it with isolated frames. So at time t equals zero seconds, the position is zero meters. Go four to half a meter at 0.33 seconds, 0.67 seconds, 2.55, and 4.05. So we went forward by one third of a second each time and we're able to see the position of the cart at each of those times. Based on that, we're going to start from acceleration and work backwards with our graphs. So which of the following shows a possible graph of acceleration versus time for the student on the skateboard? And if you remember, I've said we're talking about constant acceleration then. So you want to find a graph that represents constant acceleration. So when acceleration is constant, you should get a horizontal line of acceleration versus time because it always has the same value. We're going to look again. This time you're going to be thinking about what velocity versus time would look like. So we start So which of these could be a possible graph of velocity versus time? As you try to answer this question, you want to think about one, if we let, we started from zero and moved to a positive displacement. So do we expect velocity to be positive or negative? We had the same change in time between each successive picture. Do we expect that, or did we see that the change in position was the same? Or did the change in position increase with time? Or did the change in position decrease with time? You also want to think about the relationship between acceleration and velocity. If acceleration is constant, what should the graph of velocity versus time look like? Great, so when acceleration is constant, velocity versus time should be linear. It would have a slope of acceleration because we said acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with time and be either positive or negative depending on whether the acceleration is positive or negative but we would expect a linear graph of velocity versus time. Finally we want to think about position versus time. So again we'll flip through If you plotted those values of position versus time, would you expect it to be linear? Would you expect it to curve? Would you expect it to be flat? Which of these graphs could be a possible graph of position versus time for the student on the skateboard? So, what I've done here is basically take the three graphs we just looked at and put them all in one. All of these represent constant acceleration. The slope of acceleration versus time should be zero and you're just going to have a horizontal line with a value of the acceleration. For velocity versus time, the graph will have a slope of acceleration and will be linear. One thing that's important to know is it doesn't have to intersect at zero. It also doesn't have to be positive. It does have to be linear and it has to have a slope equal to A.
our final one, position versus time, will have a varying slope. We saw that the change in position with time varied, and we saw that as the students started to go faster, we got a bigger change, a steeper slope to our position versus time graph. So I said there were special equations that came with this. So that's what we're going to look at now. So calculating velocity with constant acceleration. So first, if acceleration is constant, the instantaneous acceleration has got to equal to the average acceleration because it's the same all the time. Average acceleration is just calculated as the velocity at some time minus the initial velocity divided by t minus zero. So this is a little bit different here that we have zero in this case. The reason we have zero is we are starting and making an arbitrary time zero. The only important part is that the velocity you use for v sub zero corresponds to the same time that you're setting at zero. So a car could be driving down the road at a constant speed and then begin to accelerate. Your initial velocity would be whatever that initial speed was and your initial time, your time zero, would be set at just right when it started to accelerate. And you would start your counter then, sort of start your clock right then. If we rearrange this equation a little bit, we get that the velocity at any time t, so if it's five seconds after that car started accelerating, is equal to that initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. This equation is only valid if it is constant acceleration because what we're doing is we're really writing the equation for this line right here. If you remember whenever it was in school that you learned y equals mx plus b, we're saying y, which is the velocity at any time t, is equal to the slope, would be our m, our x is t, plus b, our y-intercept. We can also calculate displacement using our constant acceleration equations. So there are two different ways we can think about average velocity. One is that average velocity is equal to the displacement over time, and that rearranges to the position at any time equals the initial position, that x sub zero is sort of set as the position at that same time you started your counter and at that same time you recorded that initial velocity plus the time times the average velocity. Because the velocity is changing linearly, we have a constant acceleration, we can also find average velocity just by averaging the final and the initial velocity. This again only works for constant acceleration. If the acceleration is changing, you really can't just average the velocity by taking the start and the end point and dividing by two. If we combine all of this, rearrange that equation, we get that the displacement at any time t is equal to the initial velocity times the time plus one half acceleration times time squared. We're going to work through some sample problems so you get a sense of how this works. An important point to remember is that your x sub zero and your v sub zero both need to be the position and the velocity right when you start your counter. So when time t equals zero, it's the position and the velocity that correspond to those. It's also important to remember that these equations are specific to constant acceleration. They don't work if acceleration is changing. We can take those two equations that we just saw, which are the first two listed here, and do a bunch of rearranging and actually get five different equations for motion with constant acceleration. What you'll see is we really have sort of five variables. So we have V, V sub zero, 
a, t, and x minus x sub 0. So we have velocity at time t, the initial velocity, the acceleration, the time t, and the displacement. Each of these equations is missing one of those terms, and they are combined in every other possible combination. Okay, thinking a little bit about how to use those equations. So say you hold a ball in your hand at a fixed height. I don't care what fixed height. Imagine whatever fixed height is perfect for you, and you release it. What would its initial velocity be? Is its initial velocity up, zero, or down? Correct, because the ball was at rest, the initial velocity was zero. It hadn't started moving yet. After you dropped it, though, it was in free fall. And free fall acceleration is a special case of constant acceleration. All around the Earth, the acceleration due to gravity has roughly the same magnitude, which we represent as a term g, and that magnitude is 9.8 meters per second squared. That means that any object that you drop in a vacuum will accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared. It doesn't matter how big the object is, what shape it is, that acceleration that's produced by gravity is the same. All of the equations that we've talked about for constant acceleration still apply, but now we're going to move vertically, so up and down instead of side to side. We generally let down be negative. So if down is negative, when we use that acceleration due to gravity in an equation, we would need to make it negative as well. So it would be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. You can actually set up your coordinate system however you want. You can let down be positive if you want. It doesn't matter. You just need to be consistent. So if down is negative, then when the ball falls from my hand to the ground, it's had a negative displacement. So this last question, I just want you to think about. If I drop a penny in a feather from the same height at the same time, which will land first? And we'll have a demonstration later on to show you guys the answer. More graphs, I know you're so excited. So which of the following could be a graph of the instantaneous velocity? So we're graphing velocity at every instant in time of a ball that's thrown straight up in the air neglecting any effect from air resistance. And we are going to measure it from right after it leaves the person's hand. So when you think about this, first think, what's the velocity when it leaves the person's hand? Is it still? Does it have an upwards velocity, downwards velocity? What would that velocity be? Second, think about what the acceleration will be for this ball as it flies through the air. Given that acceleration, what do you expect the graph of velocity versus time to look like. Correct, velocity versus time has to be linear. This is a situation of constant acceleration. The acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It is a constant acceleration down, and we see that the graph of velocity versus time is a line with a slope of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, if I throw a ball in the air and the ball initially travels upwards before traveling downwards to the ground, what can we say about velocity and acceleration from the time the ball leaves my hand till it hits the ground? So we know that acceleration is always downwards. That ball is in free fall from the minute it leaves my hand. This doesn't necessarily make sense to everyone right away because they kind of think, how can something be in free fall when it's moving upwards? 
what we really mean by it being in free fall is that its acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. And that's true from the second that ball leaves your hand until it hits the ground. We also know that the velocity has to be zero at some point in time. If I throw the ball up, it starts with an initial positive velocity and ends with a negative velocity. And to go from positive to negative, you have to pass through zero. So we know that velocity goes to zero, but what about this? A ball's thrown straight upward when it has reached the highest point in its motion and is momentarily stopped. What is its acceleration? So as you think about this one, think about is the ball still in free fall? 